All right, so in the first lecture for this week, we're going to focus on what the relationship between doctors and patients looks like. What has it looked like in the past? What does it look like now? What does it look like from the doctor side of things, from the patient side of things? Um, this interaction between doctor and patient has been studied quite a bit in sociology because it has implications for the treatment that physicians provide their patients with. Um, and so if we look at sort of historically, just in the just across the 20th century, right? So from 1900 until now, basically, how has this relationship changed? Well, in the first part of the 20th century, we saw what was referred to as this golden age of doctoring. So at this time, you'll remember that Talcott Parsons is writing about the sick role in like the 1950s. And so remember that the sick role um, is characterized by the rights and the obligations that a sick person has. So when we are sick, we are obligated to follow the doctor's orders. If we don't do that, people think that we're being weird or that there's something wrong with us. And we're also sort of obligated to have this desire to get better. Um, and so how do we do that? We follow the doctor's orders and do what the doctor tells us. And we go to the doctor, right? We seek the doctor out. So the doctor is really in this position of authority. That is the nature of the relationship. There's this asymmetrical structure, meaning that the doctor has more power than the patient does. The patient doesn't really have any authority, and the doctor has all of the knowledge and all of the authority. That leads to a system of paternalism, which refers to the idea that the doctor knows better than the patient what is good for the patient. And so the doctor sees themselves as being somebody who is in a superior position to the patient, especially in the medical encounter. And so whatever the doctor thinks is best is what the patient should do, and the patient should not really argue with that. In the latter part of the 20th century and in the early part of the 21st century, so over the last 40 years or so, you start to see a shift from this being a relationship to being more of an encounter, right? So there's some depersonalization to the encounter, um, that it becomes more of an interaction, a sort of neutral interaction as opposed to some kind of like um, doctor-patient relationship. So you're moving from doctor-patient to provider-client. There's more of mutual participation. The client is seeking out the provider. The provider is providing services to the client. There's more of this, like, we're both bringing something to this encounter than there used to be in the doctor-patient relationship. There's also, you see, more of an interference from third parties into this doctor-patient interaction, right? So, for example, insurance companies are questioning doctors' decisions on treatment that they want to give or procedures that they want to perform because the insurance companies ultimately don't want to pay for that. They are profit-motivated, and they don't want to waste money on something that's not necessary, so they will come in and question um, the interaction or, or the recommendation of the doctor, and that sort of disrupts what used to be a one-on-one a -on -one, um, interaction and relationship. You also see people shopping for doctors, so you don't see a lot of the sort of like lifetime, um, uh, not lifetime membership, but you don't have the same, like, this is my doctor, this has always been my doctor. Some of you may have that now, or may have had that up till you got to college with a pediatrician, for example, but because we move around so much and because um, when we leave our jobs, we may go to an insurance company that um, our doctor doesn't participate in that network, we would have to switch doctors. So there's a lot more um, sort of mobility from doctor to doctor in the, in the modern medical system. You also see, uh, relatedly, fewer long-term relationships. So like I said, you're not sticking with the same doctor for your whole life, which is the way that things used to be. So you might, you know, your parents or your grandparents, for example, have had the same doctor forever, especially if they've lived in the same place forever or they've worked in the same place forever. And then increasingly, these um, interactions between doctors and patients are, are becoming less personal. So 
you see uh, medical records are being um, kept electronically, right? So that's what EMR refers to, electronic medical records. You're also having more um, virtual doctor visits or what are called mouse calls where you can like log on to some um, website and have a face-to-face -face conversation with your doctor or a different doctor or maybe you can Skype with your doctor or FaceTime with your doctor as opposed to having to go in. Um, and probably that is a way for everybody to save money, for the provider to save money, for you to save money. Um, so that takes away from the sort of interpersonal nature of the doctor-patient interaction and moves it more um, toward this depersonalized neutral encounter. And so you read in the chapter that um, there's this decreasing authority of physicians and doctors, right? Alongside that, there's also research on how doctors treat and perceive their patients. And so this signals a move away from this golden age where we never questioned doctors and we would certainly never claim that their judgments were biased. This is the power of the medical model, right? Like in the age of doctor, in the golden age of doctoring, the medical model was at its finest. Any doctor would come up with the same diagnosis because an illness or a disorder has clear-cut symptoms, right? But we know from this week that doctors face a lot of uncertainty, and that uncertainty leaves room for their own perceptions about the patients to enter the equation. And so sociological research has looked at this encounter from um the provider side, right, the doctor side, to see how doctors perceive their patients and whether those perceptions influence the care that they provide. So, spoiler alert, they do. Um, so, classical medical sociology work from the 60s and the 70s looked at sort of the social desirability of patients, right? So, you have two studies that refer, that find, um, physicians referring to patients as crocs, right? If, if the patients were believed to be faking their treatment, those people were treated the most poorly by the physicians. And you also have this lovely phrase called gomers, right? Get out of my ER is what that stands for. You'd see doctors referring to patients as gomers if they felt that they were using the ER inappropriately, right? So if they were coming in with some routine problem that really could have waited until regular office hours, but here they are in the ER um, using up everybody's time and taking away beds from people who are really having emergencies. Another study from the 70s showed that um, doctors in the ER really evaluated their patients on a moral level, right? So um, patients were sometimes called dirty and smelly, and if they were dirty and smelly, they were isolated, and efforts were made to get rid of them as soon as possible. Um, you also had doctors referring to uh, people as hippies or women in scanty clothing, meaning they weren't wearing a lot of clothing, apparently. Those kinds of people were kept waiting, and any consultations that were done were done very quickly in an effort to get them out, so to minimize the interaction that the doctors had with those kinds of people. Um, and people who were drunk were handled the worst. They were handled as if they were baggage. More recent research has started to look at the implicit attitudes of doctors. So how does the race or class or gender of both the patient and the doctor matter? How does it shape the interactions that happen in that doctor-provider, sorry, doctor-patient relationship? <clears throat> So one study from 2000 found that providers, doctors, have stereotypes based on both race and on SES. So, for example, doctors rated black patients as having a greater risk for substance abuse, having a greater likelihood of being noncompliant with doctor's orders following a procedure, and being less likely to attend rehab, and also um, judged black patients as being less intelligent than their white counterparts, even when they had equal levels of education. Um, they also, the researchers also found that um, providers um, viewed low 
socioeconomic status patients, right, poorer patients, as being less likely to attend rehab. So this follows with some of the research that's been done on um, implicit attitudes of doctors using the implicit attitudes test. So the implicit attitudes test is a test you can take online, and I'll um, here's a link if you'd like to take your own implicit attitudes test. Um, you can do this on a variety of different dimensions. You can examine your own implicit attitudes on race, on religion, on gender, on mental health status. Um, and really the idea here is that we have biases that are sometimes subconscious or that we aren't fully able to acknowledge, but because we are exposed to such strong um, images about people of different racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, religious backgrounds, gender, social class, etc., that they form these pretty persistent attitudes. We form these pretty persistent attitudes about people of these different groups. And so the research that uses implicit attitudes tests among doctors is sort of um, using them to show that even if doctors don't, um, you know, outwardly display any bias or intentionally display bias, that they may have some. Uh, and so what these tests have shown is that doctors tend to show positive bias toward white upper middle class patients. They tend to show negative bias toward black and Hispanic patients, low SES patients, and obese patients. And the studies also show that, or one study in particular showed that white doctors showed a strong preference for white patients, but black doctors didn't show a racial preference at all. So you can imagine how these kinds of subtle biases w could enter into um, the doctor-patient interaction. So I can highlight some of the implications of doctor uncertainty and doctor bias that has been shown through research. So the New England Research Institute has done a series of studies on gender and coronary heart disease diagnosis. These studies didn't use actual patients or actual cases. What they did instead was they sent videos to doctors. Um, and in the videos, there were actors who were presenting, right, with classic coronary heart disease symptoms. So these are classic symptoms that included chest pain that got worse the more somebody exerted themselves, pain that felt like they were eating a really big meal, and pain that radiated between the shoulder blades. So these are classic symptoms of coronary heart disease. And so um, the people in the videos differed on a number of different characteristics, on race, on gender, on age. And so the doctor would get a video of one actor presenting with these symptoms, and their job would be to diagnose the condition and to explain how certain or uncertain they were. So what the researchers found was that the doctors did a pretty good job of diagnosing the correct condition. However, the certainty of diagnosis, right, the, the doctor's certainty that this was the thing that this patient had was much lower when the person in the video was a woman. So how do you explain this? Well, first of all, I mean, there are a couple of different explanations that were offered. I'm going to talk about two of them. One is that the medical training materials, so the things that medical students read while they're in school, may bias doctors into thinking that a certain condition is had by a certain type of person. So this picture, for example, is from a 2004 textbook. This is a picture of someone suffering from angina pectoris. This person is white, he's a male, and he is older. If these kinds of images are widespread throughout 
the literature that is being used to educate doctors, then they may subconsciously start to associate particular kinds of um, disorders and illnesses with particular kinds of people. So that's one explanation. Another explanation is that um, doctors may, um, in a medical encounter, draw on knowledge that they have about how likely the disease is to be present among a particular group of people. So with coronary heart disease in particular, it's much more common among men than it is among women. That doesn't mean that women don't get it. So in that interaction or when they're watching this video of a woman, they are perhaps having that statistic in the back of their mind. Well, women don't get this as much as men do, so maybe that's not what's going on. And they are, in effect, discriminating against women, not because they're um, biased against women because they think women are bad, but because they're using these statistics that men get it more than women to, um, it's influencing their uncertainty about whether or not this particular woman has this, whereas among men, they may be much more certain that that's the case because men are much more likely to get it. That is statistical discrimination. That's another way. Um, that the certainty is sort of not there. And it turns out that doctors who are certain about a, about a diagnosis are much more likely to ask follow-up questions, much more likely to um, give tests or exams for the condition, and much more likely to write prescriptions. So if the doctor is uncertain whether or not the patient has what they think the patient has, then they're not going to do these things, and those things may end up being life-saving recommendations or life-saving actions. So certainty is really important, and when we're only certain about particular groups of people having particular kinds of diseases, that could lead to worse outcomes for those particular groups of people. There are other examples of ways that treatment by doctors varies across different um, groups of society. So, for example, middle-aged women are often asked fewer questions in the doctor-patient interaction. They're also less likely to receive cardiac medication, again, relating to this New England Research Institute. That's a similar finding. Um, research also shows that black children are less likely than white children to be prescribed antibiotics. And research shows that black men are more likely to be diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Um, and, and the reason for this, um, the study, that the research that looked at this, the reason for this was that the, the physicians were, um, in their explanations, attributing violence, which is something that could be characteristic of paranoid schizophrenia, these outbursts or violence, they were attributing violence to black men, but not to any other groups, even when violence was not part of the case description. So because there's this cultural idea in the U.S. that black men are dangerous and violent, that was influencing the doctor's diagnosis of a person with paranoid schizophrenia when that is not, in fact, the diagnosis, that, that is not, in fact, the, the illness that they were presenting. Then on the other side of things, we can also look at how patients' perceptions of their doctors vary by social groups. So there's a growing trend of distrust in doctors, but this is especially prevalent or increasing among younger people and among people who are more educated, which, given what we've talked about in previous weeks, should make sense to you, right? Younger people and more educated people are both going to be people who have easier access to the internet or, or are more likely to be using the internet and therefore can go out and sort of figure out what's going on with themselves on their own without needing a doctor's help or intervention. A survey from 2001 found that um, people of color in the U.S. believed that they would receive better treatment if they belonged to a different race or ethnic group. They believed that the medical staff treated them disrespectfully due to their race or ethnicity. 
They also believed that the medical staff judged them unfairly due to how well they speak English. So you can see that patients are oftentimes going into interactions with medical professionals in a position of distrust. A lot of this has to do with the history of um, healthcare and the and the institution of medicine going back decades um, in the 20th century and even before that, some of which we'll talk about in week 10. But you can see that even today, I mean, this is 17 years ago, I would not be surprised if these findings are similar today. Um, but, you know, at the dawning of the 21st century, you're still seeing um, distrust among non-white groups of an institution that has, for the most part, been primarily white. You also find among minority group members that they prefer a same race doctor if they expect to be discriminated against. But as you read in your, in your textbook, this presents a problem because the occupation of physician, right, that profession has been so closed um, up until recently that the majority of doctors, as I said, are white and the majority of doctors are men. Both of those things are changing, but it would be very difficult for minority group members to seek out a doctor of the same race, particularly among Black and Hispanic Americans, because those groups are so vastly underrepresented among doctors in the U.S. So what is to be done? Well, you're starting to see institutional changes that are attempting to reduce provider bias. So um, at the um, pre-med level, you're seeing the addition of questions on both psychology and sociology to the MCAT starting in 2015. So there is increased attention to social factors and social issues and how those things influence the body um, and, and people's health. You're starting to see the inclusion of um, courses and lessons on cultural competency in the medical school curriculum. And you're also seeing broader movements to diversify medical schools in an attempt to get more people of color represented um, among physicians. And I've actually posted an article on Blackboard from The Atlantic on this very topic. It's not long, but it's a good read if you're interested. So that's all for this lecture. In the next lecture, we will look at nursing and the role of gender.